Imagine the most exquisite meal you've ever had. Perhaps it's a perfectly grilled steak or paired with impeccably roasted vegetables. Or maybe it's a creamy chicken pasta that melts in your mouth. Or how about a Greek souvlaki packed with savory vegetables and succulent meat. Maybe you're dreaming of a rich and flavorful sushi platter or a spicy and tasteful Indian curry. Maybe it's all followed up with a moist chocolate cake served with sweet caramel sauce. Now, if you're struggling to listen to this now because I've made you hungry, bear in mind I wrote all of this while I was fasting, which was a, a mission. But anyway, whatever meal you are imagining, I want you to do your best to break it down into its ingredients, okay? Now, the final result is a wonderful meal, but all the ingredients by themselves would be a lot different. We live in a world where there is more access to information than ever before. Generations, young and old, are being exposed to radically different ideologies and opinions every day. It can be so overwhelming trying to decipher what's true and what's false, but there is a way. Join me as we discuss some of the toughest questions out there about Christianity, the Bible, and culture. I'm your host, Nick Lackey. Welcome to The Garrison. Hey friends, and welcome back to another episode of The Garrison. Today we're going to be talking about suffering, which is a topic we've kind of covered before, but not as directly as I hope to do today. Now before we get right into it, I'll remind everyone again, if you want to get in touch with me, feel free to reach out on my social medias, or you can email thegarrisonpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear your feedback and also hear your questions that you want covered on The Garrison. I'll leave us out. As a Jewish Nobel Peace Prize winning author, he's an activist and a Holocaust survivor as well. And he shared in his book, Night, a story from the Auschwitz concentration camp. He tells the story of three people who were sentenced to die by hanging by one of the Nazi guards. Two of them were fully grown men, so they died very quickly. But one was a small boy, and due to his size and lack of nutrition, his body wasn't heavy enough to kill him. Vassal writes about being forced to march past these victims as he worked, and he wrote, The two men were no longer alive. Their tongues were hanging out, swollen and bluish, but the third rope was still moving. The child, too light, was still breathing, and so he remained for more than half an hour, lingering between life and death writhing before our eyes. And we were forced to look at him at close range. He was still alive when I passed him. His tongue was still red, his eyes not extinguished. When thinking about what to talk about when doing a podcast episode about suffering, I didn't only want to do a PG version. I didn't want to talk about suffering we might experience on a day-to-day basis, such as stubbing your toe or being cut off in traffic, or being insulted, or being forced to sit next to someone who makes horrendously loud chewing noises as they eat. Now instead I wanted to find an example so terrible, so hard to come to grips with, so unimaginably horrible. But why? Well, Because this type of suffering is real. This type of suffering does exist. And if we can't talk about why God would allow this type of suffering, then we shouldn't bother talking about why God will allow suffering at all. And this topic of suffering, it's a topic so important and big, and there are so many different routes we could go down to explain it. Now, time won't allow us to cover every major argument and to look at every angle, but it will allow us to cover these three points I intend to make on today's episode. These three points which are worth knowing when considering why God would allow suffering. So, Let's get into them. And just as a kind of foreword, I will use evil slash suffering interchangeably throughout the talk. I'm kind of referring to the same thing when we say why God would allow suffering and evil. I consider them to kind of go hand in hand. So firstly, I want to tell you about a hotel. I want you to imagine that there was a social experiment that was conducted. Now in the experiment, there were 10 people who were chosen and they were split into two groups of five. They were both going to be sent to a hotel to stay the night. This hotel, however, was very basic. Inside each room was a mildly comfortable bed, a small window, a toilet, a basin, 
and a chair to sit on, and a small bookshelf with some material to read. Now, the first group were told that they were going to the most luxurious five-star hotel to ever exist. They started getting their hopes up, dreaming of the silky smooth, soft, king-sized bed. They dreamed of the flow of water coming from their luxurious shower, the soft and unimaginably comfortable couch, and the view from their window, the TVs on their wall, and the free hotel towels which came with it. I mean, they were very, very excited. However, the other group were told a different story. They were told that they were being sent to a former prison. They expected to be on harsh metal bunks and with concrete floors, no view, a toilet which was right next to the bed, and no entertainment. They were dreading the thought of the upcoming stay. Now, based on these two descriptions, who do you think would have enjoyed their stay more? Well, the first group would have been severely disappointed. I mean, having expected perfect luxury, they would have been enraged when they saw the simple design having humble entertainment and basic comfort. I mean, this group, they would have hated their stay. However, the second group would have been severely overjoyed. Instead of getting a prison-like cell that they had expected, they had a comfortable room with carpet on the floor, with a comfortable bed, they had reading material to keep them entertained, and they even had a wee view out their window. I mean, this group would have loved their stay. Now, what relevance does this have to talking about suffering? Well, if we fail to understand suffering, we may be like the first group. We might look at this world and see all the pain and suffering and conclude that God is either evil or he's not real at all, and we might live our life in misery. However, if we do understand suffering properly, we may be more like the second group. We will learn to appreciate all that God has given us, the beauty of his creation, the grace that he has imparted to us, in allowing us to enjoy this life and all that he has created. We can humbly accept the world he has given us while eagerly awaiting the new one that he has prepared for those that love him. So let's do our best to understand suffering. You know, if we expect the world to be in a a perfect way and we see all the suffering, we're going to be like that first group. But if we understand suffering and, and we expect it, then we may be more like the second group. So the first point of the three that I want to make is about the fall. So then, you know, why does suffering exist in the first place? Well, it's worth pointing out that suffering hasn't always existed. Suffering wasn't something that God designed and placed in the Garden of Eden and then called it good. There was an initial point where it was first introduced. Now, I'm sure most of us will be familiar with what this was, and this was called the fall. As a quick recap for those who may be unfamiliar, here's what happened. God made the heavens and the earth. He formed the waters and the land, the animals, the vegetation, mountains, rivers, fruits, vegetables, up and go, or at least the ingredients necessary for up and go. And he called all of it good. Then God finished by making the best thing of all of this creation, which was humans. And after this, he calls his creation very good. Now, notice something about the creation of woman from man. The Bible says that God created woman out of the rib of Adam. In other words, woman was created right under man's arm and close to his heart, which is a beautiful depiction of where a woman is to be with a man, under his arm and close to his heart. And it's quite cute. Anyway, moving on, Scripture also says that God put man into a deep sleep. But Scripture never says he ever woke up which would explain why us men are rather clumsy and hopeless all the time. But thank God he's given us women as our helpmate. Okay, moving on. Life was good in the garden. The garden was perfect, and man and woman were living together in harmony with each other and with God, but then they had to go and stuff it all up. So what happened? Well, God had given man a command. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, why did God make this tree in the first place? Why did he have to make it? Well, because by doing so, wasn't he creating the possibility of evil? Well, maybe so. And we'll get to that in the second point. But let's focus on the first for now. Adam and Eve had a choice. 
They could choose whether or not they would obey God by choosing whether or not they would eat from that tree. Now, guess what happened next? Well, Eve was tempted and she ate from the tree. But what was the temptation from the devil? He had said, and this is Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, we could get into the meaning behind that, but for the case of this topic, here's the point. Adam and Eve messed up. They chose to disobey God. So what did that mean for the rest of creation? Well, this is where the curse happens, where God curses creation. And from verse 16, God says to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. In this short passage, we can see that physical pain is now possible because there will be pain in childbearing. And we know that there's going to be relationship tensions because uh, the, the woman will desire to be, uh, her desire will be contrary to her husband, but he shall rule over her. Verse 17, And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. In other words, the ground is cursed. Creation itself is no longer perfect. Suddenly we've got uh, verse 18. It says, Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. We know that creation was cursed because of the sin of Adam and Eve. And verse 19, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We know that there's going to be hard work and heavy labor in this world as well. This was a result of the curse. And in short, the punishment for sinning ultimately is death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us this. For the wages of sin is death. And God has cursed the whole of creation because of man's sin. All around us, suffering is proof that man is a sinner. We see broken families, broken relationships, and in my case, many broken bones. Uh, we see a broken environment, and ultimately, we see broken humans. This is evidence that the world is broken, and that we were the ones to break it. We are the problem. We are the ones to cause suffering in the first place. So that's the first point. Why does suffering exist? Well, because of the fall, because of mankind's sin. The second point is about free will. Suppose one day that there was a guy called Jeff. Let's call him Jeff. And he loved a girl and her name was Mary. Jeff really loved Mary. And Mary, she was amazing. Now imagine one day that this guy Jeff went up to Mary and he confessed all of his feelings for her. And he asked her out. But she comes back with an uppercut and says, I like you as a friend, Jeff. Only as a friend. Ouch. Now there's no relationship here. But what if Jeff said to Mary, you are my girlfriend and I'm going to force you to love me? You know, a bit creepy, right? But is that really a true relationship? Well, of course not. We all understand that in order for there to be a real relationship, love must be freely given. Both people must decide that they want to be in this committed relationship. So we know why we have free will, but what does this have to do with suffering? Well, in the same way that in order for a relationship to happen between Jeff and Mary, love must be freely given between the two. The same is true of God and us. He wants there to be a relationship between him and us. But it also has to be freely given. If God said, no, I'm going to force you to love me, that's not genuine love and there is no authentic relationship there. The same free will that allows us to choose whether we want to accept Christ. Christ's sacrifice and be in relationship with God is the same free will which allows me to slap someone in the face if I wanted to. Now, I'm not going to go and do that, but I could if I wanted to, right? It's the same free will that allows people to choose whether to lie or to tell the truth, to give or to steal, to protect life or to take it, to start a charity or to start a terrorist organization. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. used his free will to fight against oppression. Hitler used his free will to commit genocide. 
William Wilberforce used his free will to fight against slavery, but Islamic jihadists used their free will to fly, in, to fly planes into the World Trade Center. You can see here that we have free will. We have the ability to make our own decisions and choose what we want to do with our bodies and with our words as well. But with this free will comes the possibility of suffering. So you may, you may say, well, if free will is really the source of evil and suffering, and God created free will, therefore did he create evil and suffering? Well, no, not quite. God did not create evil. Instead, he created the possibility of evil. Because only in a world with the possibility of evil would there be the possibility of love. Think of it this way. Imagine that you got a brand new Lamborghini. You use this thing day after day, rain and shine, but eventually you realize that you preferred Ferraris. And so you grabbed one of those instead. And did I mention you probably have to be quite rich for this to happen? But anyway, you don't sell the Lamborghini. Instead, you keep it outside under the pine trees. I mean, five years pass and you start to crave the feeling of the Lamborghini again. You've gotten tired of the Ferrari. So you go to the car, you take off the cover, and you realize that there's a bunch of rust. I mean, the whole thing's rusted. Uh-oh, now who do you blame for the rust? Do we go to Lamborghini and say, give me my money back, you gave me a rusty Lamborghini? Well, no, of course not. That would be ridiculous. What did Lamborghini do? Well, they created one of the most beautiful looking sports cars made with pristine materials and care, and they gave it to you. But you abused it by placing it outside under a pine tree where it was exposed to years of wet weather, and it ended up rusting. Lamborghini didn't create rust. They created a car with the possibility of rust. And because you abused it, it rusted. And the exact same is true of free will. God gave us free will, but we abused it. We chose to use it to disobey him and sin, and we get all the consequences which come along with that, which come along with disobeying God and sinning. The result? A whole lot of evil and suffering. <clears throat> That's the second point I want to make, is that God has given us free will, not that we might sin, but that we might freely choose to accept Him and be in relationship with Him. And this free will is absolutely necessary for a relationship to happen between God, the Creator, and us, the, the creation. Without free will, there would be no purpose to creating us. We'll just be like, robots who are forced to love them. No, only with free will is true love possible. So that's the second point. And the final point is about the best meal ever. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we read, And we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. If you are someone who loves God, you can be assured that all things in your life are being used by good, but, sorry, by used, being used by God for good. Now, isn't that reassuring? I mean, Paul writes just beforehand in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I mean, Paul understood what it was like to suffer. In Corinthians, he writes, uh, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in wilderness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Paul is describing the sufferings that he has experienced. And man, this guy has been through a lot. My life barely compares to the amount of suffering that Paul has been through. But here's the point I want to make. Think back to the best meal ever. I first heard this analogy from the Living Waters podcast, which is a fantastic podcast that I'd recommend to everyone. But they did an episode on suffering, and they talked about this. They said, imagine the most exquisite meal you've ever had. Perhaps it's a perfectly grilled steak or paired with 
impeccably roasted vegetables. Or maybe it's a creamy chicken pasta that melts in your mouth. Or how about a Greek souvlaki packed with savory vegetables and succulent meat. Maybe you're dreaming of a rich and flavorful sushi platter or a spicy and tasteful Indian curry. Maybe it's all followed up with a moist chocolate cake served with sweet caramel sauce. Now, if you're struggling to listen to this now because I've made you hungry, bear in mind I wrote all of this while I was fasting, which was a, a mission. But anyway, whatever meal you are imagining, I want you to do your best to break it down into its ingredients, okay? Now, the final result is a wonderful meal, but all the ingredients by themselves would be a lot different. Imagine trying to eat a chocolate cake by starting with just the flour. You know, you put a tablespoon in and you swallow it down and then you add some cocoa powder and swallow it down. Then you add a spoonful of sugar and you swallow it down and you re repeat the process over and over. Uh, maybe add some <laughs> a few raw eggs and some vanilla essence and, and boom, I mean, it's a chocolate cake, right? Well, not really. You see, the ingredients themselves don't taste that yummy. In fact, you might really struggle to get them down your system. You would probably dislike the taste of some of the ingredients the ingredients as well. But when you put all the ingredients together, you get a beautiful and tasty meal. Well, how does this relate? Well, just like how eating individual ingredients of a cake is going to taste horrible, it's going to be hard to swallow, and it might cause you some pain, sometimes our lives' events can be a wee bit like that. It's hard when we are physically injured or sick. It's hard when we go through a breakup or, or we lose a loved one. It's hard to be rejected, to be bullied, or to feel alone. But what if our God was big enough to use all of this for the ultimate good in the end? What if, like, by combining ingredients we get a beautiful cake, God combines personal suffering to create a beautiful character? What if he used everything together for his and our ultimate good? I mean, the word says that he does. That's what we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. What if all those times you hurt yourself, he was teaching you patience? What if all those times you were rejected, he was teaching you courage? What if all those times you failed, he was teaching you perseverance? And what if all those personal losses you had, he was teaching you to lean into him? I mean, ask yourself this question. Would you be the person you are today? without the suffering that you've experienced. I know I wouldn't be. God has used many separate instances of suffering to teach me many different things and to grow me in my character. And although he doesn't cause suffering, he is such a good God that he won't allow the enemy to have his way. The enemy wants us to suffer, but what he intends for evil, God will use for good. I mean, what a comfort that is. I have a friend, and we often have the saying that, uh, where we say, oh, that's just another teaspoon of cinnamon. Basically, every time something goes wrong, rather than get really sad and depressed about it, we see it as an ingredient in the cake that God is baking in our character. Maybe we lost our ear pods. Well, you know, that's a wee teaspoon of cinnamon. Or, or maybe we broke a bone and that's a tablespoon of cinnamon. Or maybe something even bigger happens in our life, even more tragic, and we consider that a giant bowl of cinnamon. But, but the general idea here is that God will use these sufferings and these unfortunate things in our life in order for the ultimate good. And we, know, we may not always be able to see that ultimate good, particularly in the moment, but in hindsight, when we look back in our life, we can see how God does use suffering in our life to actually grow our character. Perhaps he uses it for a greater good and a greater purpose. What if God was allowing you to experience that small hindrance during your morning? Because if you hadn't, you may have experienced a larger one later in the day. I mean, he works all things together. I mean, last week, my car ran out of fuel uh, because my brother didn't fill it up with petrol. Now, I could have raged and complained, but instead I thought, what if God allowed this to happen? Because if I had got back into my car and it did have fuel, I would have been hit by a truck. I don't know. We will never know, I suppose. But having this mindset helps us get through suffering. It helps us understand why God may be allowing these things to happen. I once heard a, a bit of a parable, and it talked about the son who had broken his leg. 
And initially he thought, man, this is really bad luck. But the day after, the army came in and wanted to recruit him to fight the war. But he couldn't because he had a broken leg. So then he thought, oh man, this is actually quite good luck. You can see here that we may view one instance as being really negative and being full of suffering. But two days later, we might be able to look back at that event and think, man, I'm really grateful that happened because it caused me not to experience this even larger amount of suffering in the future. That's why I think in James chapter 1, verse 2, he writes, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I mean, with this mindset where we just trust that God is using all things together for good, we truly can count it all joy when we fall into instances of suffering. So I want to conclude with this. I started talking about the horrible, horrible atrocities of the concentration camps during the time of the Nazi regime. Ali Vassal, he says, Behind me I heard a man asking, For God's sake, where is God? And from within me I heard a voice answer, Where is he? This is where. Hanging here from this gallows. That's from his book, Night. What's the point? Well, where is God in all of our suffering? When, when Ali was looking towards the boy who, who had been hung and was just in a horrible state of suffering, where is God? Well, this is what he concluded. He was there hanging with the boy. What, what does he mean by this? Well, when man sinned in Genesis 3, they were naked and ashamed. So God killed an animal and covered their shame with the skins of the animal. This foreshadowed what he would do thousands of years later and kill the perfect lamb in order to cover our sins. This perfect lamb being Jesus. I mean, in Christianity, God isn't a distant being who simply observes our suffering or or maybe enjoys it. No, he himself has experienced it. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, this is talking about Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Now, I know this passage is more talking about the temptations that Jesus experienced, but the same is true of his sufferings. We know that Jesus suffered in many of the same ways that you and I suffer. Jesus can sympathize with us. He's not some distant God who's just observing. He truly can sympathize with our suffering because he himself has experienced it. I want to read a quote from a guy called Gregory of Nazianzus. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but he wrote this in 381 AD. This is what he says, talking about Jesus. He began his ministry by being hungry, yet he is the bread of life. And he ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty, yet he is the living water. Jesus was weary, yet he is our rest. Jesus paid tribute, yet he is the king. Jesus was accused of having a demon, yet he cast out demons. Jesus wept, yet he wipes away our tears. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, yet he redeemed the world. Jesus was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, yet he is the good shepherd. Jesus died, yet by his death, he destroyed the power of death. This is the true God. This is the God who can relate to us. This is the God who understands us. This is the God who helps us in times of suffering. And I want to finish with one final quote from a theologian named John Stott. And here's what he says. I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. The only God I believe is the one that Nietzsche ridiculed as God on the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? I have entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of Buddha, his legs crossed, arms folded, 
eyes closed, the ghost of a smile playing round his mouth, a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. But each time, after a while, I have had to turn away. And an imagination I have turned instead to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross. Nails pierced through hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged into God-forsaken darkness. That is the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in the light of this. Now there is still a question mark against human suffering, but over it we boldly stamp another mark, the cross that symbolizes divine suffering. The cross of Christ is God's only self-justification in such a world as ours. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou did stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. Friends, if you have never responded to the gospel before, now is the time. God gave us free will to make this decision. Yet all of us have chosen to abuse free will at some stage and have chosen to sin. And because we have sinned, we deserve to be punished for breaking God's moral law. We have caused suffering in other people's lives. And in order for God to enact justice, he must punish us. But instead, because he is a good and loving and merciful God as well, he made a way in which justice could still be satisfied. Someone could still suffer for our sin. And he did it himself. He died on the cross for you and I. By Jesus' sacrifice alone, we can be forgiven. Every burden of sin can be unloaded. We can have freedom in Christ and we can live with him eternally. He offers this to us as a free gift. And all we need to do to accept this free gift is to repent of our sin and to put our trust in him alone. That is the good news of Christianity. And if you forget everything in this podcast, accept that, then I'm happy. That is the one thing I want you to remember. That freedom from your sin, forgiveness from your sin can be found because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And the final point I'll make is that because of this sacrifice, we can be given eternal life. And when we die, we can live eternally with Jesus on the new earth that he is preparing for us. The new earth where every tear he will wipe away, where there will be no more death or sorrow or mourning, where all the suffering we've experienced on this world right now is not even possible in that world. The perfect world with no suffering. That is what I fix my eyes on every day. Fix my eyes on eternity with Jesus and and the wonders that that will be. I cannot wait. And I really hope that everyone listening to this episode will be there with me. I'm actually going to finish with prayer. I don't normally finish my podcast episodes with prayer, but I just want to pray. Dear Father, thank you for everyone who's listened to this episode. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us all to understand suffering. And Lord, even when it seems we cannot understand it, Lord, just help us to trust that you are working all things together for good. And I pray for those who haven't yet repented of their sin and put their trust in you. I pray that they would do that right now, that they would do it before it's too late, before they die, and that they would spend eternity with you on the new earth that you have created and and have prepared for us. A world with no suffering. Lord, I pray everyone listening would, would be in that place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you everybody for listening to this episode of The Garrison. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to share it with other people, to leave your comments and your ratings as that helps more people uh, hear about the episode and, and hear about The Garrison. Thank you everyone for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of The Garrison.